What if Puss actually made his wish? What if this astronomical anomaly helped Puss's dreams come to pass instead of just smashing on the ground and shattering like glass? What if Senor Frisky Whiskers embarked on his own single-player adventure without any interruptions from the rest of the cast? What would his map quest directions have in store for him? Would he have the strength and willpower to see his journey through to the end? And what effect would his wish have on the fabric of reality at large? Well, after seeing what is easily my favorite animated film of 2022... <sighs> fine, second favorite. I've been itching to talk about the Stabby Tabby's magnum opus in a brand new light. So let's see what would happen if Puss's initial wish for more lives actually came true, and what tragic ramifications would emerge as a result. I wish I may, I wish I might, show off these fanfics I love to write. My name is Dr. Box, and I shall be your guide through this point of existence in the animation multiverse. Unguard! But before we even think about starting this journey, we gotta take a look at the map. If there's a wish you wanna grant, while I drag you through the emotional ringer of fear and disparity making you curl up in terror and swallow your pants, I'm the map! Hey, wanna see my matches? Oh my bad, sorry about that. Guess he's dead. No more songs, let's move on. Anyway, as far as magical MacGuffins go, the Wishing Star map is one impressive piece of parchment. It's literally capable of terraforming the dark forest in seconds, depending on which Wish Hunter's hands are wrapped around it. At first, the characters assume that this map is just some kind of spooky, scary security, meant to deter users from making a wish at all. And while that's technically kinda true, I feel like there are more layers to it than that. The stars have layers. The way I see it is that the Wishing Star map is meant to be a helpful guide that leads you towards the ultimate solution to your heart's greatest desire in more ways than one. It technically does lead you to Old Twinkle Twinkle, which would be a quick and easy solution to any problem, but the tailor-made steps you take along the way are clearly meant to show you that the thing you wish for might be obtainable without needing magic at all. This map literally states that it knows your path and knows your heart, basically implying that it not only knows the path you should take to the star itself, but also the path of self-discovery and realization that might help you reconsider what you actually need. I mean, just look at some of the stops that we actually get to see in the movie. Like the Cave of Lost Souls, where Puss confronts his eight other lives and sees what a cocky, stuck-up, wasteful jerk he's been, and then realizing that merely being a legend isn't all it's cracked up to be. Or what about Nostalgia Pines, where Goldie sees visions of her past and starts to realize that her greatest desire may not be blood-related or picturesque, but it's still as real as any family could be. The map is clearly doing everything it can to show that a simple change of mind, a respect for the life you currently have, a different perspective on what family entails is all you really need to solve your problem. The only real exception to this rule is Perito, who straight up says he doesn't even want a wish. So when his heart is scanned and the map realizes that he doesn't actually need anything, it figures that the least it can do is throw this poor, tortured soul a soothing bone, complete with aromatherapy, relaxation therapy, and anything it can do to make him happy. You can even argue that it tries to take some of the most tragic moments in Perito's life and attach a more happy memory to them. I mean, one of his stops is literally a river. The place where his old family almost drowned him. And now, thanks to the map, rivers can be associated with friends and relaxation instead of abandonment. If that's what they were going for, that's freaking adorable. But the thing I love the most about the Wish map is that at the end of the day, it still does take you to the star if none of these stops are effective. It doesn't gatekeep the wish in any way, there's no final boss you have to fight before you touch the star, it just takes you through a three-step journey of introspection, and if that's not enough to sway you, you're more than welcome to just use the star to get what you want. It feels like this map, and by extension the star itself, really does want to help people in any way it can either through simple realization, or if it comes to it, magical assistance. It's like your personal psychiatrist that suggests you talk through your problems with him to find a solution, but if the pain really is too much to bear, he'll gladly prescribe you some medication that will just make the pain go away. I'm more than willing to give you this star, but let's try talking about this first. But now, with all of that in mind, it's time for the good stuff. Let's take a deep look at the star of our show and see what his journey would be like if he snagged the map and entered the forest alone. No outside interactions, no characters following with or behind him, just him 
the map, and whatever it has in store for him. Vamanos! <laughs> Okay, so this new version of the story is going to begin with a very simple change. We all remember the big chase scene through Jack Horner's Pie Factory, where Puss and Kitty burst through the door with map in hand as Goldie, the Bears, and Jack try to take them down, right? Well, in this new version, Jack's going to think faster and actually barricade the door before they escape. Heck, maybe he bars it with this convenient trident that was right next to him. This would literally pull the rug out from under the kitties and trap the seven characters in the same small room. The bears would lift the shelf off of them, and then a massive tussle would ensue for ownership of the map. They'd be jumping off shelves, smashing through walls. Magical artifacts and potions would go flying everywhere, some of which would hit the other characters and turn them into things like frogs or chickens temporarily. And then when the fairy dust clears, all the characters would be magically incapacitated, except for one who gets away with the map. And in this case, that one would be Puss. After emerging from a 1v6 battle with his target acquired and barely a scratch, Puss's heroic ego starts to reinflate a little bit. He bursts through the front door to Jack's factory with a smug grin on his face, making an exit just like the good old days. Perito would still be waiting outside in his little gold card. Puss would shout, VAMANOS PERO! The archers and villagers would try to shoot him down, but he'd dodge the arrows no problem, and maybe even lob some sacks of gold to knock them out. He'd tip over the remaining coins to serve as a distraction, and they'd make their escape. After the Reaper taunts him one more time, of course. Seriously, this image is freaking terrifying. I love it so much. Now in the original, this is where our heroes would just make a straight shot towards their destination after reading that the Dark Forest is where they need to go. But because Puss is on such an ego high after that near perfect mission, he first decides to make a stop in Mama Luna's place and drop Perito off, wanting to do this mission alone. Perito's a little upset since he was hoping that he could help Puss on his adventure, but Puss kneels down and tells him, Pero, 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 you have the most important job of all! When I'm gone, I want you to set up the largest, grandest fiesta your paws can manage, and when I return with my brand new lives, we shall party till the break of day! Perito is 100% on board with this plan and promises to get started right away, as Puss rides off on his cart to the dark forest where the wishing star lies. Alrighty, now that Puss is all settled in the forest, let's take a nice long look at the three stops on Puss's personalized path. We have the Valley of Incineration, Undertaker's Ridge, and the Cave of Lost Souls. We know that Puss's ultimate goal in all this is to wish for more lives so he can get back to being a legend. And I imagine that the star would do its best to show him that instead of just getting more lives, he should simply appreciate the one that he has left. And it does this by showing him the drawbacks of what could happen if he made the wish and continued being wasteful. But I'm sure you're all still wondering how exactly these three specific steps factor into that idea. Well, first off, we have the Valley of Incineration, which should be pretty self-explanatory. It's a valley full of freaking fire. And what does fire do best? It burns, burns, burns. At first, this stop just seems like your typical generic scary deterrent, like, ooh, the flames are spooky, abandon all hope, ye who enters here. Basically something to just frighten puss away but I see it more as a literal painful lesson for him. I think it's safe to say that burning in any capacity, whether it be injury or death, is incredibly painful. Probably the most painful thing imaginable aside from drowning. And I like to think that as Puss passes through the Valley of Incineration, courtesy of these handy little stepping rocks, each rock he puts his foot on has the potential to be a completely stable surface or spawn a massive geyser of fire when stepped on. His overconfidence leads to many missteps, ending with him getting badly burned many times and maybe even singeing his new beard off, and only when he starts taking the path more cautiously does the valley finally end and he can continue on. This first stop would basically show Puss that if he does wish for more lives and continues to be frivolous with them, it's going to lead to a lot of searing physical pain. He may not be able to die per se, but there will still be a world of hurt out there where one inevitable misstep can lead to a lot of physical burden. Burden that he may have to carry on his own for a long time. A pretty simple first lesson, but it makes sense to start with the most direct and basic one. The themes of pain continue in Undertaker's Ridge, a deep canyon of cacophonous coffins that Puss is forced to trek through. He's constantly surrounded by death on all sides, with the coffins opening up one by one as the corpses inside gaze down at him. At first, Puss is not too scared of this, seeing this as a mere kitty carnival ride. But then the emerging corpses start to become more and more familiar looking. 
They go from random Tom, Dick, and Harrys that he's never seen before, to the citizens of the towns that he helped to save in the past, to the citizens of San Ricardo, his hometown, many of whom he was friends with, to his bestest buddies from far, far away, to Mama Imelda, his adoptive mother from the first movie. This makes Puss stop dead in his tracks. He looks at all of these corpses in horror and disbelief as they stare down at him with sorrowful black voids for eyes, clearly forlorn over the loss of something. Or perhaps, someone. And if this wasn't enough to scare him, he eventually sees a coffin containing the corpse of Kitty Softpaws, dressed in full wedding garb like a freaking corpse bride. She's the one who looks the saddest of all, barely even able to look Puss in the face. The memories of Santa Colombia come flooding back to his head as he thinks about the life he could have had if he just stopped focusing so much on his status. Puss desperately tries to claw up the walls of the canyon to reach out to the corpses of his friends and family. I'm here! I can help you all! But the walls are just too high for him to scale and they all just close their eyes and shut their coffins. It's too late now. And if all this wasn't bad enough, Puss hears a familiar whistle upon the wind. And then, out of the shadows, death emerges right behind the corpse of Kitty. He looks at Puss with his blood-red eyes as he tucks a mourning Kitty into her coffin and shuts it for her. This causes Puss to full sprint out of the canyon as fast as he can, emotionally and mentally rattled, but able to gather just enough composure to press on. In case it wasn't obvious already, the symbolism here is twofold. If Puss continues with this legend-prolonging, life-wasting lifestyle, not only will he be missing out on genuine emotional fulfillment that could be gained through retaining friends and a loving wife, but he'd also be depriving them of a better existence for having lived alongside him. They'd essentially crawl into their graves one day, having lived their lives with something important missing that could have been there if Puss had only been there. Continuing this cycle of cocky legend living would not only lead to physical pain, but emotional pain for all involved. There's something to think about, Mr. Fearless Hero. And then of course it all ends with the Cave of Lost Souls, which we already got to witness in the original movie. Puss enters a cave of literal self-reflection, where his previous aid lives have a little talk with him. And while he enjoys their company at first, once they mention the idea of becoming a legend again, he starts to have some second thoughts. Is it really worth it to go on like this, spending another octet of existence trying to keep a legend from dying, being boastful and wasteful, doing nothing but indulging in whatever cheap thrills you can get your claws on, and then when the music stops and the party's over, having no one truly close to you that you can call friend or family, no one to help soothe the inevitable pain that comes with living, both physical and emotional? Is it worth it to continue being mirrors of these cocky jokers, acting like you're stronger than everyone? everyone else, smarter than everyone else, above rules, above fate? Is that really who you want to be? Maybe instead of focusing on prolonging a legendary status and living an existence of shallow emptiness at the same time, Puss could just appreciate and value the one remaining life he has right now, become a more happy and fulfilled feline instead of just a title to be slapped on a statue or a ballad. In the end, he doesn't really need the wishing star. He just needs to open his eyes and see the light. Now, as much as I would love to type the end right here and just say that Puss leaves the forest to go and live a better life, we still have to remember that Big Daddy Death Wolf is hot on his tail. And much like in the original movie, Death does end up encountering Puss in the cave. He gives one of the best villain reveal lines I've heard in forever, starts smashing the crystals containing Puss's eight lives, and the feared feline makes a full sprint for the wishing star, not looking back or hesitating for even a second. He touches down on the glowing five-pointed magical mass, and just as he's about to make his wish, Death shows up right in front of him, creates a ring of fire, and gives Puss the same speech he did in the original while kicking a familiar sword towards him. Are you gonna take the coward's way out, run away to more lives, or are you gonna pick that up and fight? Well, believe it or not, in this scenario, Puss actually chooses the former.
Because he doesn't have the recent happy memories and kinship of Kitty and Perito, he can't muster up the strength to fight in this scenario and ends up giving in to his crippling fear. As death charges towards him, Puss says, I, I, I wish for nine more! No, I, I wish for nine hundred! Uh, uh. And then right before death is about to strike him down, he screams, I wish for infinite lives! And then, just like that, Boosh! The star engulfs Puss in a beam of light before slowly lowering him down to the ground as it fades from existence. Death stands in the star-shaped crater alongside him, a face full of anger and disappointment. He throws down his sickles and flips his cape, looking back to say, Well, no use in counting anymore. Enjoy eternity, you coward. And just like that, he vanishes, leaving Puss by himself. Puss begs that the wish be taken back. This isn't what he really wanted. He'd be fine with just one life. Please take it back. He'll do anything. But it's too late. The wish is gone, and Puss is now immortal. The next few years of Puss's existence are plagued with confusion, doubt, and existential crisis. He no longer has the passion or fire to keep his legend alive anymore, never throwing parties or posing for portraits ever again. He is willing to stick his neck out for people in need, but never for the glory anymore. He figures that these people only have one life, and it's only fair that they get to live it to the fullest. He doesn't bother forming any long-term relationships or even rekindling old ones. What would the point be since he's gonna outlive them all anyway, watching them slowly die in his arms while he remains pristine and infinite? He has no motivation, no real goals, nothing that truly drives him any longer. He just keeps living on and on and on and on. But then, one day long after the wish incident, Puss does get a little bit of spark back. He decides to try picking himself up and at least socialize a little bit. Maybe he could attend a simple get-together, or even a small fiesta if he's feeling up to... Wait. Small? Fiesta? Oh no, he completely forgot about the fiesta that Penito was throwing for him! He immediately makes a beeline for Mama Luna's house, taking the fastest transit he can think of to get there, hoping Penito can forgive him for not showing up. But when he eventually gets to the address, he realizes that the house was long abandoned. Mama Luna had already fled with her cats to a place that was safer, more discreet, and less prone to Australian bear attacks. However, one person still remained on the premises, Perito, sitting there, smiling, with a party hat on, alongside deflated balloons and long-spoiled food, looking far more old, disheveled, and filthy than he did when Puss last left him. A pine-sized version of Odysseus's dog, just sitting there like a lifelong loyal friend, awaiting his master's return. Puss! You finally made it! I made you a cake! Puss looks down at Perito with bittersweet eyes, happy that he's still alive, but saddened by the state that he's in. The two of them then party for days and days, playing games, singing songs, and even eating some of the now spoiled cake. Cause let's face it, what does Puss have to lose by doing that, right? They make the fiesta last as long as they possibly can, before inevitably, Perito passes away of old age a few days later. Puss takes his tiny little body and actually puts it in the same hole where he once buried his heroic attire, as if to say that even in death, the two of them will always be connected, in story and in memory. Puss then kneels down and pays his respects at the tiny P-marked grave. No longer P for Puss, but now P for Perito. Whoa! 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 Okay, I apologize to all y'all. I did not expect this AU to go as dark as it did. 
But hey, much like how Puss learned to appreciate the one life he has, writing this story certainly made me appreciate the happy ending we actually got. Oh well, I'm gonna go stream this movie for the 9 billionth time. But before then, let's hear what you guys think. What are your thoughts on The Last Wish? What did you think of my new version? And would you maybe want to see a part 2 where I put certain other characters in Puss's boots and have them take the Wishing Star journey alone? I'm always up for discussion, so leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.